Welcome back to another episode of the Best Phone Plans Podcast. I'm Stetson, and with me today, as always, is Dennis. Dennis, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, coming away from an awesome holiday and into a new one. That's that's great to hear. Yeah, out with the old, in with the new. I'm ready for 2021. I don't know about uh, you. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm definitely excited for 2021 because a lot has definitely happened over 2020. <laughs> it's it's so true. A lot has happened, and um, yeah, I'm actually maybe we can segue that into some of the things we saw in the in the wireless space this year because I feel like it was a pretty big year from wireless, right? We got new plans from did did everyone but T-Mobile announce new plans this year? So that'd be AT and T. And well, T-Mobile had the Internet Essentials plan that was relevant. Oh yeah. Good call, Dennis. So I think I think all the major carriers had new plans this year. That and they also had the fifteen dollar uh, two gig plan as well yeah. this year. So yeah, yeah, every carrier had new plans. I think did did AT and T they included they added the HBO Max bundle this year, right? Yeah, that was yeah elite. I think AT and T elite was this year actually, and yeah, they also did mix and match this year. Yep, AT&T Unlimited Your Way. That was huge. I mean, that was overdue where you can now mix and match your AT&T plans. Uh, way more competitive, kind of goes up against Verizon. And we also saw new plans from Verizon too this year where they introduced new plans. I think better naming, but I don't know, Dennis, what do you think about these names? They're kind of ridiculous. It's start. No, I, those were the old names. The new names are uh, Unlimited. Get more, play more, do, do more. more. <laughs> Listen, Verizon, Verizon, I feel like caught a bad case at and and is doing some real confusing marketing. I mean, what is the difference? I mean, literally, I was looking at the Get More and Play More Unlimited plans, and the Play More was just a worse version of the Get More. Like, it was cloud storage, but no Hulu and Disney Plus, but they're the same price point. Verizon, yeah. got to get your act together with these plans. I actually agree with you. I thought... The new plans seemed great to some degree, but I actually thought they were a little bad because Verizon made by default all the plans uh, defaulted video streaming quality to 480p, which is kind of a, a bummer. 480p on the better ones, though. Well, that that's the thing, Dennis. You actually have to go into your account and enable 720p. Oh, so the same thing T-Mobile and AT&T do. Okay. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly that. I think to save on network bandwidth. And then they actually dropped the amount of priority data that was in their top tier plan down from 75 gigs to 50 gigs so now they're all the same they did do that they did indeed well i guess that would lead nicely into a big question of this year okay um as like a nice recap to tie things off for people that are going into 2021 what do you think who had the best family plan basically of this year oh wow that's such a great question and you know i think that depends because you know, if you're an AT&T customer, all of a sudden they got way more competitive because you could have one line of unlimited elite, right? You could get your HBO Max and then you could drop your other lines down to unlimited extra or unlimited starter and save a couple bucks a month on your bill. So I think that was a great option. I think T-Mobile uh, killed it. I mean, because all taxes and fees are included. And then Verizon's always been pretty competitive. Uh, you could always mix and match your plans and... I think they added some great perks with Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus, and with Apple Music for their top tier premium plan. So yeah. Over, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one right now. I'm gonna go with T Mobile. And the reason I'm picking T Mobile is all taxes and fees are included. And I think just the price you get for four lines of magenta is such a good value compared to what the other offerings are. What's your take, Dennis? Yeah, I don't even think it was a competition this year. T Mobile literally had it hands down because not only did the taxes and fees included, but they did two free line deals this year. They did one earlier and then one around Christmas. That's still I actually wait. I think they did three free line deals. I might be so, mistaken on that. So, yeah, I mean, literally this year, if you would have got T-Mobile at the beginning of the year, got two lines, the other two or three, um, based off what Stetson just said, would have been free. So, like, you could literally be rocking, like, a nice four-line family plan right now for, like, a nice smooth 120 bucks. Like that's great value. And unlike with like the mixing and matching AT&T stuff, these can all be like some nice like magenta plus lines we're talking about. So T-Mobile hands down as far as plans are concerned on the post paid side for family plans has got the W. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Now, what about on the prepaid side? Because that's your bread and butter stats. And who do you think has the best 
family plan on the prepaid slash NBNO side? So this is a great question. I think there's a bunch of great options that emerge this year. Uh, on the T-Mobile network, I think Metro is another compelling offer because they're a little bit more budget focused and they do include Amazon Prime in one of their plans. But I will say for the cost of multi-line, when you kind of break it out, uh, it's basically like around the same price as Magenta. So I almost feel like just bumping up to get priority access on the T-Mobile network would be uh, worth it. In terms of the prepaid landscape, I actually want to give a shout out to Mint Mobile because they launched their Mint family, I believe it was this year. And you can now, it's not really a family discount, so to speak, but you can now just easily manage multiple lines under one account. And maybe it's not the best for like four or five line uh, plans, but for you know couples or maybe a family of three, I think that's a really helpful feature where you can get Mint Mobile's sort of budget, more affordable service uh, at a, and make it easier to manage for multiple lines. Let me give you a guideline so that way you have a more like focused point when I say family. Let's just go with sure. a family of four as the standard since that's Sweet. usually where carriers tend to have their best price and we'll stick to a family of four. All right, then I think the winner is easily... Okay, I'll pick two. I'll go Visible, uh, best cheap unlimited data plan out there. Phenomenal option. Uh, party pay was great. The downside is that Billing is still separate between the accounts, but when you're getting 25 bucks per line for unlimited, and I guess if you have four lines, I don't know. I actually don't know if you can like merge the billing together. I'm pretty sure they still say separate. They say uh, separate. You, you could easily throw the same card on all the accounts or whatever. Like it wouldn't be as big a deal, in my opinion. Uh, and then in terms of the other carrier, I want to give a shout out to was actually US Mobile, right? So they launched for the first time ever. They launched a multi-line discount, so you can get four lines of their unlimited all plan, which I've covered is actually a 50 gig plan on the Verizon network. And they offer a discount where it starts out at $40 a line and it drops to $30 a line. And then lines three and four are actually just $20 per line. Um, so the total cost is probably around, they say $110. If you add on US Mobile's taxes and fees, maybe you're looking at like $130, which is still reasonable. And... What makes this plan so cool and why I'm giving it the shout out is you can actually pair it with two of your favorite perks, right? So with four lines, you can pick uh, from a whole selection. They got Spotify family, Apple Music family, uh, Apple TV plus, Disney plus, Hulu, ESPN plus, Netflix, HBO Max is on there. And uh, to me, I thought this was a really clever way of a carrier that may not necessarily be able to make the kind of agreements that Verizon and T-Mobile are making, but to be able to find a way to offer these services as perks as well. All right. I, I can respect those choices. Um, so I'm going to do mine a little different. I have two plans, but they're for two different types of family. Okay. Um, one. So the first one I would focus on is the family that doesn't actually use a lot of cell phone data. The people, you know, that are staying at home all the time now because they got work from home jobs because of COVID and they're just always around Wi-Fi. for that family. Ironically enough, I think the best carrier option for them is one of the cable company options like Xfinity's mobile service. Oh, yeah, yeah. You brought this up. So what makes that a great option for them? So Xfinity mobile, you buy like a bucket of data, which they got some limited data options, which is kind of kind of stinks. And you do have to have their Internet, but they have these data options so like 10 gigs is 60 bucks, but they don't have line access charges or any of that other like fees like there's no activation fee there's not like there's not a lot of fees or anything the only thing you have to worry about on top of that 60 bucks is whatever your state's like you know when one charges like in pennsylvania that's like a dollar 65 for us and then like 50 cents of sales tax so for a family of four for 10 gigs of shared data you're talking like 68 bucks total yeah that's which, that's a really good deal i mean each person's getting what like two just over two gigs maybe two and a half yeah, each person would get like two and a half gigs of data, which I know is not crazy amount, but <laughs> for, the, for the people who are watching this live on YouTube, I feel like they would definitely use more than two and a half gigs per line. But Dennis, you brought up at the beginning, this is for people who have more of a budget and light user household. Right. Or more importantly, their usage is more of a Wi-Fi. They're not using their cell phone data. And just to be clear, it doesn't have to be divvied up in 2.5 gigs. Like, it's a whole bucket, right? So, Stetson, if you are the person that needs to use more phone data because you're out and about more and you use 6 gigs, the rest of the family has 4 still to, like, do whatever with. But, yes, this is for the budget-conscious family. Like, this is, like, your cheapest or 
what I believe is your cheapest option, right? I think it works out to being like what, like fifteen dollars per line at that point, right? Like that's a really good price, um, and it's on the Verizon network, which is cool. But that's for the like light user family that needs like a really cheap bundle. Um, however, on the more premium side or the unlimited user, um, I was gonna say Metro was doing a deal, and I think they're still doing a deal where it's four lines for a hundred bucks. And I would say that's where it's at going with Metro because from your testing from your earlier video, Metro PCS's data, I believe when you were doing the testing had about the same priority as postpaid or higher than the centrals. Was that right? Uh, so it's actually at the same tier as MVNO. MVNO. Yeah. Which so be about the same as mint. Exactly. Yeah. So it kind of like, that's where I see if you need unlimited, I think Metro could be a killer deal where you could get Amazon prime bundled in uh, four lines for 120 bucks, 15 gigs of hotspot data, and you're getting Google one storage included as well. Um, but I also feel like, you know, the cost between that and maybe Magenta, you know, I think it is kind of up in the air. I mean, what's great and what's kind of my takeaway for 2020 is we actually saw some fantastic deals and fantastic options from all of the carriers. Uh, and, you know, since I've been following this industry for the past, I don't know, eight years at this point, uh, this is one of the most affordable uh, times to be considering a cell phone plan. Yeah. I mean, my big reason for picking Metro is 100 bucks is because it's 100 bucks because their tax and fees are included, I believe, with Metro. That's right? true. That is very true. So and it's I... 100 bucks even, um, which I know that works out to be about the same as the visible um, plan that you yep. mentioned, Verizon. But T-Mobile's network management doesn't seem to be as strict as like, I, like when you I, were running. Yeah, so I, I, just to jump in here, I think it's not necessarily T-Mobile's less strict. I just think they have more uh, bandwidth and network capacity where I think Verizon's network uh, is congested in more areas, which is why visible customers uh, can have such a poor experience sometimes. Right. And then the Amazon, the free Amazon is huge. I mean, who doesn't use Amazon, right? That That's true. Although I actually don't have Prime and I actively try and avoid ordering on Amazon. Um, but that's just my, me. My man, as soon as I lived in state college and got to have the joys of like fresh delivery, oh. it was game over. <laughs> That'll do it. That will do it. Um, yeah, so that, those are pretty good. Dennis, if you were to pick one premium plan this year, right? We had some great options. T-Mobile, Magenta, Magenta Plus, AT&T, Unlimited Elite, throwing in the HBO Max subscription, or Verizon's new, shoot, what do they call it? Get More Unlimited plan with Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus, and Apple Music. Uh, who do you think is taking the crown for the best premium plan this year? Easily hands down AT&T's elite plan, hands down. Yeah, HBO Max is a huge value. I love that service. I mean, just great content. Like HBO had a huge catalog of already good content from just original HBO. They got the Time Warner content on there with some of my favorite cartoons that I watched growing up, like Looney Tunes. Uh, they got new movies coming out now, straight out of theaters like Wonder Woman. Like HBO Max is great. Um, the plan itself, all on its own right, is great. I mean, 100 gigs of postpaid priority data on the AT&T network is huge. That's 30 huge. gigs that's, of hotspot. That's actually the most in the industry right now. 100 gigs of priority data. There's no other plan I've been able to find. Maybe a, a business plan that I'm not aware of. But I think 100 gigs of priority data on the consumer side is the most that's currently available. Now, I will just say, though, the only like caveat or weakness is if you're someone that travels, then the crown still goes to T-Mobile for their amazing international roaming. However, with COVID going on um, and the fact that I don't travel that often, we already had a discussion about other things that you can do. For me, it's AT&T. Hands down, no one better. You got good network, great plan. There's just there's no real faults for me in that plan. So Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with you. I mean, you know, it does depend on what network works better in your area. But I think in terms of if all networks are equal in your area, I think... Dennis, you nailed it. AT&T is crushing it with their unlimited elite plan. Although I do wish uh, taxes and fees would be included. And we actually talked about that on our previous episode. Okay, wait, uh, next next topic. This is interesting. Dennis, do you have a plan that would you consider the biggest bust or the worst plan of the year? You read my mind. Um, biggest bust for the year. If you don't have one, I have one ready to go. Um, I'm going to just throw it out to 
the AT and T like two gig offering that they were doing there shortly. Oh <laughs> yeah, that was pretty bad. Wait, do you see? I don't know if you're able to go to AT and T's website right now, but sure. they're offering a four gig plan. And oh man, I can't pull up the price on the top of my head. I think it's like sixty five dollars a month or something like that for postpaid. Yeah, so I'm on their website right now. I'm trying to scroll through all their clerk because, of course, they market their unlimited first. Um, so forty unlimited. again. I see it. Forty bucks. 40 no, bucks. that's for that's for five lines though. Oh, oh, fifty bucks for one line. Oh my god. <laughs> fifty bucks for four gigs of data. Okay, what? Who is doing that? Uh, just to throw out some comparisons, we have U.S. Mobile, thirty dollars, thirty gigs. Visible, 40 bucks, unlimited, like literally unlimited. So the fact that AT&T is charging $50 for four gigs is an absolute, absolute risk, rip off. And the fact that it only goes down to $40 per month per line for five lines, when you can get, how much is one of their unlimited plans? $35 uh, for unlimited extra? Yeah, it works out to be the same. And let's not even forget too, man, um, if you got the discounts for being like a teacher or first responder, uh, you could even get the elite plan at that like pricing of per line. So <laughs> it's not a good deal at all. <laughs> <laughs> that is unbelievable. And this is actually a new, oh wait, sorry. I'm just reading this now. Data overage, $10 per two gigs. Woof. <laughs> Woof. I mean, uh, have you seen Verizon shared gig data plans, man? They're also terrible. I mean, they chart, they're like, they're old school with like Verizon shared data plans are old school where you buy the data bucket and you have to pay like the $20 per smartphone line, $10 per watch. The shared data plans from like the postpaid carriers are just terrible. They're <laughs> so bad. I, you know what? I should probably make a video on just how bad they are and just warn people like, don't sign up for these. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I think the AT&T 4 gig plan is definitely getting a nomination there. The other plans that I want to throw out are actually from Boost Mobile. And the reason I'm saying Boost Mobile is because they were previously owned by Sprint, right? Mm -hmm. And they offered unlimited plans. And these were actually true unlimited data plans, uh, somewhat similar to what Metro is doing, right? Where you got like, I think 35 gigs of the higher speed data. And then once you used over 35 gigs, you were deprioritized. But... What happened was after the merger, when Boost Mobile was acquired by Dish, they suddenly had to pay T-Mobile to get access to their network. So these true unlimited data plans suddenly got capped, capped at 35 gigs. And then you were switched to unlimited data at 2G speeds. So I think uh, that deserves my nomination for bust of the year as well, because you know, you're signing up for a plan you think is unlimited, and then all of a sudden, your data is basically getting shut off, which is uh, it's no fun. It's no bueno. It's not a good experience. Not only that, but it's more expensive than it used to be as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, Boost. Although I will just say I don't fault them too much considering the situation that Dish is in at the moment. So, yeah, but, I, yeah. I totally yeah. understand it. I mean, it makes sense. It's kind of like, here's why they did it. Okay, like. If you use less than 35 gigs, I'm sure it's fine. You know, they probably have some reasonable multi-line pricing as well. I mean, um, we saw Metro or uh, not Metro, excuse me. We saw Mint when they roll out their unlimited plan. It's not really like a true unlimited plan. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just have to know what you're getting into. And I think yeah. that's kind of the bummer here is that, you know, all these people who were on true unlimited plans suddenly got capped at 35 gigs and um, not the best experience, in my opinion. So we talked about the best premium. We talked about some probably some of the best cheaper plans already and so forth. But my question to you is if you had to pick just one plan to win the absolute like overall crown for being MVP, which plan is that for you? Yeah, this is a really great question. I think, I mean, for me, I'll give a light shout out to mint because I use them as my personal carrier. But I think honestly for this year, I think Visible's true unlimited data plan at, you know, when you get that multi-line discount for 25 bucks a month, I honestly feel that's just such a good value for so many people. It really does help out. You're getting Verizon coverage and um, yeah, it's just so affordable with all taxes and fees included and unlimited hotspot data. I mean, it's almost, it's really hard to compete with that. So I think that might just be, I mean, the deprioritization is real. And I mean, you could very easily like, rip that plan apart just because of how slow and potentially unusable it is in certain markets but um 
I don't know. I just feel like the value you got, especially at a time this year when, you know, people needed more value than before. I feel like that plan is kind of my MVP right now. Uh, Dennis, what are you, what are your thoughts? Do you have a top pick? Yeah. Um, ironically enough, even though I didn't mention them when I was talking earlier, I give it to us mobile. Oh um, yeah. They're another great company. I was going to say, and the reason I give it to us mobile is because for people like myself, they do have add-ons to give me higher speed data. Uh, and I also really love what they did as far as actually giving me the option to choose um, like a service to get reimbursed on. If I have like a family of four lines, to me, that's immense value. And they're not like forcing me to have Netflix, for example, if I didn't want Netflix. And I just love how they're handling it. Like it's just a credit that they apply on my bill. It's not real convoluted. So for me, overall package, U.S. Mobile. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point. And we definitely got to actually, I had US Mobile down for my most improved planner carrier because we saw them update their plans multiple times this year. Their $15 plan went from two and a half gigs to three and a half gigs, which is actually kind of a better deal than Mint Mobile. US Mobile's taxes and fees will make that $19.19, so closer to 20 bucks a month, but still phenomenal for a monthly option. Uh, and the family discount. This is the first year they introduced the family discount, which is huge. And they now offer international eSIM plans so you can get data on the go, which I think is incredible. Even in the United States, they have options, which I was really blown away at just uh, the huge strides and improvement US Mobile made this year. I think Wi-Fi calling is now available on the T-Mobile network as well. Um, so yeah, that's my most that's my most improved. And it sounds like uh, your overall top pick for the year. Yeah, that's my overall top pick for the year. I think it suits the most people. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to our next topic here. I had some recap big things that happened over 2020. And looking through some of the items, we basically touched on a lot of the different things. Uh, the one thing that stood out to me actually was uh, getting a call from Ryan Reynolds. Middle of the uh, pandemic, right? I don't know if uh, you were aware of this, but... Ryan Reynolds basically left a, they did a campaign where he left a voicemail to all Mint Mobile customers. And it was, um, it was pretty humorous, pretty funny. Great way to get some engagement and interaction. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was very aware of it because I literally looked it up on YouTube because I don't have Mint personally. And I subscribed to Ryan Reynolds' channel and I've been watching all his commercials, which... Yeah, aren't they um, so good, Dennis? What do you think of them? I, I love them. Like the most recent one, I actually saw a really recent one recently on Reddit. I was scrolling down and for Christmas, he had this commercial. He was talking about like having like a low budget and it just has two hands on like a green screen. He's like, it's it's like all about saving you money. And it's talking about the buy three, get free, uh, three free months on Mint Mobile. So yeah, no, that that was awesome. But no, I, I told you about that call and we probably talked. I was like, where what carrier like who what company actually does that calls all their customers and leaves a voicemail and i loved that uh mint ran with it and then did a follow-up video of some of the calls that people called him back yeah with. i love that i love that people actually took the time to call that number back and then leave a voicemail of their own dude that was honestly it brought such a smile to my face um which was just awesome um Taking it from this joyous point, I want to say something that was cool that I'm excited about starting to finally happen, and it's that many more carriers started to embrace eSIM, albeit in a frustrating way, at least it's being adopted at this point, right? Like we saw uh, eSIM support across all the major carriers finally like, take effect, like AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, and then Verizon prepaid as well, and AT&T prepaid, like we saw that come out. Uh, Visible's getting eSIM support, even though you already heard my horror story. Yeah, um, um, that's like on my list. Maybe I'll do that this week or something. Just an eSIM activation guide for people. Yeah, and then I'm just really glad that that technology is finally starting to become adopted more widely because I think it's going to be uh, pretty huge um, just from a consumer standpoint and experience because we already talked about some of the perks, right? Of Absolutely. That. Yeah, so. I mean, easy switching, easy activation, try a, a service or coverage before switching. I think it'll be immense and uh, it'll be great when that rolls out even further. I think another thing this year is uh, to me, this felt like a really big 5G year. Um, but do you feel like how do you feel like the carriers handled 5G? And uh, do you feel like 2020 was the year of 5G or do you think it'll really be like 2021 or, or even later? Um. So I think this was the year that 5g became like a buzzword to the average consumer 
Uh, I definitely don't actually think 5G is really being utilized in any meaningful way. Like right now to me, 5G is nothing more than an icon. It's the same way whenever we were going into LT, right? We had that baby step of HSPA plus. Remember, you know, remember when AT&T said we had the fastest, strongest signal 4G network and Timo was doing their fake, you know, 4G as well. Yeah, that's where I feel 5G is at right now, right? Like they're incorporating bits and pieces of the technology, but the synergy and the things that need to happen to make it actually perform as 5G the standard has it happening. Yeah, so this is definitely not the year. I don't even think next year. I don't even think next year is going to be the year for 5G, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think in my mind, what we're really waiting on is for the current auction to finish up. And then we have to wait for all of these bands to be decommissioned. And then we have to wait for Verizon AT&T to actually go ahead and build out their sort of mid-band 5G networks. And I think once those begin to roll out, that's really when... I think we'll be in like 5G prime time. That's my well, there, take. Well, there's a lot of things, right? I mean, even if I snap my fingers in Verizon, and everybody had the spectrum they needed. We still have to wait on the permitting, which takes a long time. Uh, right now, you know, a lot of equipment isn't really up to necessary snuff for all the providers. Uh, phone support, you know, isn't hasn't reached mass adoption to the point yet where you know, we can start decommissioning like LT networks and moving more spectrum over to other things. I mean, there's a lot that needs to happen. I think 5G to be the the thing that I want it to be. We're looking like three years out. I mean, we're talking funding. We need workers. Like there's a lot of time here. Um, what I will say this year was kind of cool, though, was is that I think this year was pretty exciting overall as far as like cell phones are concerned, um, like Apple you know, had a huge mic drop. They did something that was fairly uncharacteristic of Apple. You know, they made multiple different flavors of their phone and Apple phones have never been cheaper, right? They got the iPhone SE on the budget side. They got the mini for the people that love the smaller phone. The regular 12 finally has a full HD screen. They finally got away from that retina display. Yeah, and it's Um, uh, OLED now, which is pretty huge in my opinion. Right. So Apple did awesome this year for phones. Uh, Samsung has been doing some cool things for phones. Um, You know, we have, you know, like, I think this was the year for like smartphones to finally like catch up and start doing their thing. But as far as like network providers and 5G, eh, I I feel like it was just marketing at this point. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Dennis, I think you summarized that perfectly. This was the year of the 5G phone with 5G in the iPhone 12. We had Galaxy S20 uh, getting great 5G support and pretty much all of Samsung's lineup, as well as other affordable 5G phones hit the market. But it just wasn't the networks aren't there yet. So the foundation yeah. has been laid, though, at least like at least the foundation is here. <laughs> exactly. And when the, the networks are able to flip the switch and turn on, uh, many more people will be able to connect as they've been upgrading their phones. Um and okay, here's another thing. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with Dish? You know, it sounds like the rollout for the 5G networks may be three years down the road. Uh, do we have any idea what what Dish is doing? Are they going to be building a network? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Dennis? So from my understanding and news that I've heard from our good friend Sneed, uh, Dish is right now kind of implementing like a virtual like way to manage the network for its network core. And I'm actually really excited for Dish. And also not that I have low expectations for them because I know their track record with actually utilizing the spectrum hasn't been great, but I'm also really excited. Like it's not often that a network or a, a company gets like to have like a fresh start. So like when dish does do their rollout, they don't have to worry about the hassle of decommissioning old stuff, right? They're just starting from scratch. They can start with the latest and greatest, kind of like what T-Mobile did when they first rolled out LT, right? Like T-Mobile yeah. was so far behind that when it did finally come time for them to deploy LTE, you know, they were doing 4 by 4 MIMO. They were early to HD calling. So um, anyway, I was getting off topic. Sorry. So for Dish, uh, I do think they're going to deploy the network because they have to. Right now, I don't think it's going to be anything meaningfully fast, though, because they kind of got, I believe they're currently in like a lawsuit with the Department of Justice um, right now about Spectrum, and they got other things to worry about. Yeah, that sounds about right. But I am excited to see what they'll do. I I do think that they're going to mainly be utilizing the T-Mobile network for like the foreseeable future, the same way T-Mobile relied on AT&T's roaming for a long time there to fill in coverage gaps. 
but I can see Dish becoming pretty prominent in certain urban like localized markets the same way we see carriers like us cellular thrive in like a regional sense i think we might see dish begin to creep in that approach you know focus on urban and expand out to rural america as time goes on i'm, I'm uh, really hoping they're able to pull it off i think the industry could use another competitor from my understanding dish does have the spectrum so if they're able to deploy it in an effective manner uh, they could make something that's really awesome so i, I am rooting for them and hoping that you know we can connect to dish it'll say dish in my iphone <laughs> status bar in the top corner or whatever um but yeah i think uh i'm excited and i hope it it works out and you know dish is able to to make something cool here i mean i will just say i'm really excited to see what they do with plans because they have a lot of good assets right like they got sling the streaming tv service which is relatively affordable you know it's a skinny bundle i'd be really interested to see what they end up coming out with uh, as far as like a premium bundle to add value, right? Like, like I feel like they can incorporate that a little bit. And also, Dish, generally speaking, has usually been pretty um, geared towards being like cost effective, like the the bargain option, like yeah. in, their, in their bread and butter cable space, right? So I'm hoping they'll do something similar to that. Kind of feel like the Sprint niche to control prices from just skyrocketing up as soon as T-Mobile's agreement ends that they had for merging with sprint to not right right it. and but. honestly to some degree dish almost is doing that already i mean my understanding is they have access to the t-mobile network at a ridiculously affordable price and they're able to offer that in terms of uh the new plans we saw from tang super affordable and even though i was roasting them earlier uh boost mobile for new customers at least uh dish did announce some really competitive plans there as well where it's like 15 bucks for a gig uh, like 25 bucks for five gigs, things like that. So I do hope they think, can. Yeah. Do you think Dish is going to have a hard time convincing people that they're a cell phone provider now? Oh, 100%. I mean, I think when it comes to a major provider, right? A lot of companies, I feel like Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, I feel like they just throw money at TV ad spots, sponsoring events, really getting their name out there. Dish is going to have to go up against this, right? And I think they're going to have to allocate some of their budget to just like letting people know that their network exists. But at the same time, they also need the network to be good. So if people choose to sign up, they stay customers. They don't immediately switch back to Verizon or back to AT&T. So I'll, I'll just be interested to follow this story. And uh, I'm definitely keeping it subscribed to Sneed Mobile Tech on YouTube and his Sneed Mobile Tech podcast so I can stay in the loop. And I wish I could say that would be linked in the video description, but I will definitely have it in the show notes if you're listening to the audio format of this podcast. So Stetson, I've had enough of talking about 2020 at this point. Okay, let's I hear you. Let's look into the future a little bit. Do you got any New Year's resolutions for yourself personally for the for the year 2021? That that's a great question. I haven't, you know, really spent too much time thinking about it to be honest with you because uh to me the end of the year just sort of came out of nowhere and jumped. I've been really focused on a lot of the end of the year videos and working on editing one right now that I'm hoping to get up today or tomorrow, which I'm excited to share. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of personal goals and, and uh, resolutions, I'm thinking of trying to develop better sleep patterns and habits. I know uh, my sleep schedule personally has been kind of a wreck recently in the recent weeks. And so I feel like developing a routine. And then I also had this idea this morning, I wanted to incentivize myself to work out. So I like made this objective where all right if i work out maybe 60 days in a row i can buy myself the airpod pros and um things like that but yeah i mean in general i'd say uh get on a regular sleep schedule work out on a regular basis maybe four days a week or something like that or if i do my 60 day challenge we'll see how that goes um and yeah that's that's kind of my personal goals right now uh do you have any new year's resolutions or objectives going forward into 2021 yeah, so 2021 is going to be a big year for me. Uh, going back to school to get my master's, so investing nice in myself again. Um, my house is being built. Uh, it got pushed back to being completed in March, but uh, going to be a first-time homeowner, so that's kind of cool. Looking forward to all the responsibilities that come with that. That is and, super exciting, Dennis. Congratulations. And then hopefully 2021 will be a better year for the economy so I can continue to grow in my career path and continue to get even higher paying job. That's the that's the big goal with me going back to school. Try to get even higher paid 
uh, position within my company or um, maybe end up being a lucky devil and working for Verizon or someone and get some free <laughs> cell phone service. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, do you have like an ideal salary in mind? Like, do you want to be earning like hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars a year? Yeah. Uh, uh, ideal salary for me, uh, would be like 120 K. Um, that sounds great. I was going to say reason I pick that number is because with all the taxes and oh, fun yeah. stuff, it's going to realistically be about around like the 80,000 mark, which is a very comfortable lifestyle that I can then use to plan for like uh, a family with my girlfriend and, you know, all the adulty things that, you know, people dream of. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want to make some more moolah. And then that way, maybe I can be more like Carlos and have like one cell phone plan with like business lead and <laughs> all that different stuff too. you know, do some really He's amazing. Cool. He's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I almost want to say my goal would be to earn 200, maybe $300,000 so that I could pay someone as a full-time employee and pay them an adequate like 120K salary, right? Or something like that. <laughs> well, well, guys, you know what's going to happen now. Uh, Stetson said it. He's going to pay me 120K. He's going to be the one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I think it'd, be, it'd just be so fun to be able to like build a business that can really just pay its employees well. And I think you know, it really inspired me to to say that is that I was watching a Linus Tech Tips video on, you know, how much money he's earning and where his revenue streams come from. And, you know, one of the commenters said, you know, like, congratulations, you're uh, providing a job and a means of, you know, uh, supporting a family for 30 people. Like, that's incredible. I thought that was so cool. So props to Linus for building that empire. And, you know, maybe that's something I'll take baby steps towards, you know, get an employee number one and employee number two. We'll, we'll see what happens. Well, Stetson, if we're talking business talk, you know what? It's bad. I didn't even think about this. But honestly, if we want a goal for the channel, uh, I'm hoping that 2021 will be the year that our podcast like really takes off. Maybe we could get I would love it if we could by the end of 2021, if we could have a podcast live stream where we have 5000 concurrent viewers. Woohoo! That is crazy. That is an ambitious goal. And I love to hear that. I don't know. I have so I have mixed feelings about this, and I'll tell you why. It's because I feel like we can do an excellent job creating the podcast because that's what's within our control. But sometimes when it comes to viewership, uh, that's just not something we necessarily have control over. And I say this as kind of myself, where you know, at one point I was hoping to hit like five hundred thousand views per month on YouTube, and it's like, wait, you know, I really can't control that. All I can really control is how many videos I'm putting out and the quality of the videos I've been putting out. And so I guess for my channel, I've been focusing on like the quality, doing like more in-depth analysis of certain plans and speed tests uh, and just trying to make videos that are more interesting that people want to see. While we can't control the amount of concurrent viewers, if we do everything else right, I think it'll all come. I mean, we got an awesome loyal fan base. I'm sure if we do like some crazy special or set some goal, like, you know what? I'll, I'll just say it now. Guys, if we get an episode of this podcast, where we have 5,000 concurrent live stream viewers, I will turn on my camera and I will pie myself on the face for the stream. That's wow. I mean. That's incredible. You know what, Dennis? I see that. I honor it. I respect it. I will stand with you and I will also turn my camera on and pie myself in the face for the live stream of 5,000 concurrent viewers. There we go, guys. I just said although, a mission. Although, to mission be fair, it here. might have to be the following stream because we won't know if we hit 5,000 or if we're going to hit 5,000 when we go into the stream. Fair, fair point. But, you know, you could always buy one of those cans of like whip it. Those things last forever and just have it on hand and then just get like a, a plate or something and just put whip it cream on it. So there you go. I mean, that stuff lasts for like ever, right? So that's true. That's true. All right. I love it. That's going to be the goal for this podcast by the end of the year. Dennis, we're going to work together and we're going to try and make that happen. Um, yeah. Any, anything else going forward? I mean, no, nah, I mean, I mean, obviously there's lots of goals and dreams and honestly, I set them pretty high enough that even if I fail, I still got somewhere further. So, uh, I'm not one of those people that's like, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. I just kind of have more vague goals because I know life's not a straight path, right? It's usually, I agree with that. Yes. Yeah. For but... me, it's like about, about consistency and doing it. And I'm happy to say, Dennis, this is our fourth episode of the podcast and they've been coming out every Thursday and I love it.
I love it. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's been great. You know, I just thought of one other goal though. Yeah, uh, 2021 will be the year where we get some guests on. Um, yes, yes, I completely agree. I, we will definitely make that happen. There will be guests on the show. I might have to change up the interface of the live stream because right now we have two phones, but we're gonna need a third phone for having guests on and stuff. But definitely. yeah. That'll definitely happen. Uh, I think last episode we talked about a lot of the New Year's resolutions we would give to the uh, the carriers and the networks. Um, do you want to quickly just touch on some of the things we'd love to see going forward? Yeah, we can recap that. So my big thing for T-Mobile was make 2020, 2021 the year of focusing on their network and infrastructure, basically. Uh, my network resolution for Verizon was to focus on their plans because they're not really that competitive anymore. Um, as far as the plan itself is concerned. And then for AT&T, uh, I, believe my, I believe my network resolution for them was improving their customer service, I believe. I think it's just customer service, app experience, website interface, all that bundled in one. But let, let's go on to a fun topic because you had a pretty good one. We both mutually love this YouTuber. He goes by MKBHD. Uh, you want to tell him about what he did for the end of the year? Yeah. So every year, MKBHD Marquez Brownlee does his annual smartphone awards video where he goes up and he gives out awards to his top picks for the best phones in certain categories. He's got best big phone, best compact phone, best camera, best uh, best budget phone, the biggest bust of the year and the MVP and something I was thinking about is like, you know, what cell phone plans would go great with these different phones, right? Because, you know, Marquez doesn't really touch on this in his reviews, but some of the phones he actually does review don't actually have great support here in the United States, right? So uh, one of the phones, the best big smartphone, the Xiaomi Mi 10 Ultra, right? It was made for the Chinese market. And it's actually missing a significant number of bands in the United States. It only has one out of eight 5G bands, band N41. It's got just six of 15 LTE bands. And it's not a great option for anyone who lives in the United States. So I thought that was kind of interesting to kind of look at, you know, what bands different phones are supporting and which ones do have the best support for the different networks. If you're, you know, in the cell phone space, you want to be able to switch networks at any time that's convenient to you and, and things like that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, what did uh, what were your thoughts on his video on his picks and um, of the of the phones, I guess, which one do you feel is great for someone who's into network technology? OK, so my thoughts on the video are I love it. His his camera quality or his cinematography skills are just incredible, right? Yeah. Um, and just the production quality is amazing. Uh, as far as my thoughts on his picks for phones, uh, I thought they weren't bad. Um, if you're just judging it on the phone and hardware. Yeah. Um, like for your example, of the big smartphone, like the Xiaomi Mi 10 Ultra, definitely no bueno uh as a u.s citizen right like that phone the only network you can pretty much use it with is t-mobile and even then you're getting a half big experience um so probably wouldn't go with that but you were asking me what the best pick was overall for the year as far as phones that came out yeah i mean um, what's yeah maybe we can talk about just our picks like what what are your highlight phones that you feel stood out to you that you really liked okay uh highlight phones for me were uh pixel uh 4a 5g i believe okay okay um that was a really nice sweet spot i enjoyed the stock android i loved that it. it had eSIM support it had a lot going for it i mean and, and, and in fact um when you were doing your 5g ultra wideband testing on the verizon network in your market i believe if i remember correctly it did a better job staying connected to the millimeter wave uh millimeter wave cell site than your Galaxy S20 did. Yeah, I'm actually not sure what was going on there, but it's true. I was using the Pixel 5 in that instance, and it actually was, it was connecting, it had a better uh, signal reception in that particular area. So so that that's definitely one of my picks. Um, a second pick of mine, and I'm going to be very specific here, um, is going to be the S20 Plus 5G. And I'm being specific because the Ultra had the camera problem, and the base S20 lacked 
uh, support for high uh, high yeah, frequency the, um, the millimeter wave. Right. So, How could they do that? That's my question. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I, reasons. But I will say the S20 Plus 5G, which is one of the phones I personally use, is another pick for mine. I think this was an all-around great phone from Samsung. It had great battery life, good camera, um, the 120 hertz display, which stinks that you can't have it at uh, UHD resolution and at the uh, 120 hertz. You have to pick like 1080p and 120 yeah. hertz or the other. But this phone was phenomenal. Uh, I think it was very well executed, especially with the mask going on, the fact that it has a fingerprint reader. I'm very pleased with this phone. And then finally... Um, the last phone that I'm going to throw out there is for people that are Apple lovers. And for me, uh, 12 Pro Max, uh, best uh, iPhone I've used in a long time. It actually blew me away in a surprising way. Um, the cameras were probably the best. Cam- I, 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 I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think Apple has the best cameras to date on the 12 Pro Max. They're that good. The video is on point. Photos are on point. It's a great all-around camera phone. Screen, also really great with that Samsung panel. Uh, The speakers are loud and crisp. It's just a really well-fleshed-out phone, and I was really impressed with that. And then, of course, it has the widest band support of pretty much all phones that have came out, right? It's going to work anywhere you go. So those are my three picks. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, I think those are great options. I would probably do Pixel 5 as well. I thought it was such a great phone from Google. It was a little bit more mid-tier focused, but it had millimeter wave support, came in at a great price point, great camera, great software experience. I love the fact they went with the classic fingerprint reader on the back. I think that's an underrated feature that I almost wish would come back in the landscape of cell phones. Um, so that was great. The S20 Plus, I actually want to give a shout out to Samsung. I had no idea about this, but going into like, as I've been exploring and dabbling in with network testing and testing network performance, I love that on Samsung phones, you can actually go in and select exactly what LTE and 5G bands are enabled and disabled. I think that is so cool. And I don't think other phones are able to do that. Am I mistaken there? I feel like I feel um, like more Android phones should, but I'm only aware of Samsung phones doing that at this time. Um, other phones can do it. Basically, Samsung makes it the easiest, though, to get into service mode. And Samsung, because they're a more popular phone compared to maybe some of the other Android companies, tends to get more third party support. Like, I'm sure you saw that uh, there was actually a cool developer on the App Store that came out with an app that made it even easier to change your band selection. It's literally just called Samsung Band Selection. It's just like a little color wheel. Um, But yeah, other phones can do it. It's just not as common knowledge. Yeah, I'll put it sure. There. I also give a shout out. um, I don't know about you, Dennis. When I pre-ordered my S20 Plus just to do the unboxing video, ended up keeping it. uh, And I think I spent like $1,200 on it. What Does that sound about right? Sounds about right. Although I will say I only spent $400 on mine. What? That's what I was going to say. Like you can buy this phone on, I'm looking on Swapper right now and it's going for like $560, $560. Yeah, no, I got it new directly from Samsung. Um, do you have like trading credit or something? Yeah, Samsung was running a really good deal. Um, I ended up trading in my old iPhone 8 Plus. Got like, I think like 500 bucks from the iPhone 8 Plus or something like that. And then um, I had like Samsung reward points for using their Samsung Pay that I also ended up using. And then I double dipped that with like cash back that I had from Discover. So out of pocket from me, as far as what I actually realistically spent, I only spent like 400 bucks. Such a so. good deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm always scared about doing some of the trade-in programs because I've heard of people like the devices won't arrive at the facility in the as-described condition or you won't get credit. What has your experience been using Samsung's program? So trade-in experience goes as follows. Uh, doing it with the carriers, nightmare. Doing it directly <laughs> with manufacturer has been a consistently good experience to me. I've never had a problem with Apple, never had a problem with Samsung. In fact, Samsung... Just, I don't know if people actually think of them like this, but they actually have great customer service in my experience. I remember when I got the Note 4, I had issues with the back camera's like optical image stabilization. It was like one of the first phones to like, adopt that back then. Yep. And what ended up happening basically was I ended up exchanging so many phones with them. The Samsung just got to the point where like the guy was just like, you know what? 
keep the other phone too. Don't even, don't even like, don't even worry about it. <laughs> walking away with like two note fours, uh, which was cool because for the one that had like the weird broken back camera, I just gave it to my dad. Like he's not taking pictures. It was still a working phone all around otherwise, and it worked out fine. And Samsung even gave me um, a credit one time towards my payments whenever like. I'm trying to remember the details of what happened. Basically, my I sent them back one of my phones and I was waiting for my replacement phone to like come in. But like something happened with like tra- I I don't know what happened, but basically it ended up getting sent back. Like okay. like it never like like came it didn't, it didn't make it. Yeah, like FedEx is weird and sucks, but that's nothing new. Um, but anyway, what ended up happening was is Samsung ended up sending me out another phone, and because of the inconvenience, they ended up giving me like a credit for like fifty bucks, and I ended up using it to buy. I'm sure they had this planned out, but I ended up using it to buy some Galaxy Buds. So yep, yep, they got you. They have it all laid out. Well, that's actually really interesting to know because sometimes this is actually my hack. Uh, you can sometimes purchase a phone in good condition that you can use for trade-in for less than the cost of the trade-in value you get for it. So it, it makes sense to actually buy a phone specifically used to trade in. Yeah. AT&T might... this year, man. AT&T oh my God, year. it was so good. They're still doing good things, man. You can get an iPhone 11 for 10 bucks a month finance and they're doing $700 off, I believe, on the new 12 Pro Max still. Oh, uh, yeah. Props well, to AT&T. Although I will just say, um, on the topic of buying new phones, are you actually a fan of like the whole trade in program? Because me personally, I wish carriers would kind of go back a little bit to when they just did brawl price points off. Like, um, if you look on Xfinity, uh, I keep bringing up Xfinity and I'm sorry, but if you look on Xfinity Mobile's website, right? Right now they're doing $250 off on all the iPhones. Yep. And it doesn't require a trade in any like, like anything where you just have to transfer your number from another provider and like activate a line or whatever. And they just give you the 250 off, which I appreciate that simplicity because then I can do something else with the phone, right? Like I could get, I could keep it as a backup. I can give it to my little cousin. You know, I could do other things with the phone that still has value and it's preventing some e-waste, um, which I know is like an off related topic, but also um, with Xfinity right now for going into the new year, if you, I believe it's only if you order online, but uh, if you order internet and then you activate their cell phone service, they're doing a deal right now on the iPhone SE where you can get an iPhone SE for free. So 400 bucks off and stack that with like a $200 Visa card. So like 600 bucks that you get. And then you're still getting like an extra discount on the internet side as well. Cause you get like $10 off if you have their cell phone service bundled. So like from a value standpoint, it ends up working out to be about the same of like what companies like AT&T are doing, but I don't have to give them my old phone, which still has value to me, right? Like I can still do something with it. I could probably sell it to someone and get more in cash than using it as a trade-in sometimes. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on trading programs? Like, do you like that? Or would you prefer carriers just went back to the old way of saying like, you know, stick with us for two years and we'll give you the phone for like a hundred bucks or whatever they subsidize it as. I'm big on keeping my independence and actually not getting locked into any kind of financing agreement. So I can certainly respect, you know, people you're on a family plan with Verizon. Uh, you've been with them for a while. You know, they have great coverage in your area and you're going to continue being a Verizon customer. I totally get it. it makes sense to take advantage of any trade and promotions they offer. But for me personally, as someone who, you know, switches carriers so frequently and who tests out all the different networks, I'm actually a bigger fan of, you know, buying the phone at full price outright and then uh, selling it on selling my old phone online on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, Swappa, things like that. Um, just because for me, I feel like it works out better and I appreciate the extra flexibility. And to your point, you know, with what Xfinity Mobile is doing, uh, it sounds like the device is basically uh, there's probably like a 60 day lock because they use Verizon for coverage. And that's typical on the Verizon network. Um, but, yeah, just getting the phone outright and being able to do whatever you want with it. I think like I'd rather offer have deals that are less value, um, but provide me that like a hundred dollars off a phone versus seven hundred dollars off. But I'm locked into an agreement with an expensive plan or something like that. That's my I- take. I gotcha. Yeah, I, I do appreciate the freedom of what you're talking about. But on the same token, 
Well, I, I'm not going to look at things with rose tinted glasses because I remember when you used to get in those contracts, you used to just jack up your rate anyway while you were finding or uh, getting the phone subsidized. So it wasn't really a deal. But yeah, the plan was expensive, uh, even if the phone was more affordable. And, you know, that's my whole thing is if, you know, you have a situation like with uh, the current pandemic where um, you basically have circumstances change and you suddenly need to you, you use less data or you need to call people more. And I think it makes sense where um, I think it makes sense to be, have that flexibility where you can switch plans and you can pick something that meets your needs and you can actually end up saving money. So for example, if you are, you know, locked into a Verizon commitment, then, you know, you're stuck paying that $70, $80 a month, $90 a month for an individual versus if you have the phone outright, you know, you can enjoy the premium data and the premium service when you need it. But suddenly, if you don't need it, you can switch to a more affordable plan. And to me, I think that's really where the value is, where you can potentially save, you know, $50, dollars a month or even more and you know an example that i like to bring up just because i know it off the top of my head uh is with you know uh t-mobile and mint mobile t-mobile magenta 70 bucks a month but if you can get the same you know pretty similar service and you meet your needs with mint mobile and it's 20 bucks a month you're saving 50 dollars a month or 600 dollars a year that's huge same thing goes with verizon where if you're saving you know if you're on verizon 80 dollars a month and you go with visible you're saving for what five hundred twenty dollars a year, I also think that's huge. So, I don't know. I think it goes either way. I think if you're in a family plan and you can take advantage of the promotions, you know, absolutely go for it. But if you're someone like me, more of an individual, I think the freedom and flexibility, uh, even like to to have the option to switch carriers in the future and take advantage of maybe a new trade and deal for a different carrier, uh, is a way to go as well. But yeah, that's kind of um, that's kind of my take there. Uh, Dennis, should we move on to some of our Patreon questions and, and thought questions for the show? Um, I want to talk about recent news before we do that real quick. Oh, that is a great point. Yeah, what happened uh, in the news? Actually, some some pretty huge things recently, right? Yeah, two major instances. So um, since we have a lot of cross overlap with viewers on our channel, I'm sure you've already heard about some of it from Sneed or uh, other awesome YouTubers in the community. But um, there was the Christmas bombing that happened at a central office in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, at at and headquarters kind of deal that like knocked out um, tons of Internet infrastructure and caused thousands of people to not have uh, their cell phone service work with AT&T and T-Mobile in the area. And I believe even Verizon for a short, short period of time, although they got some like emergency cell sites set up. Um, so that happened recently. And then also, um, even more recently, T-Mobile got, uh, hacked and had, uh, customer private information basically exposed yet again. Um, which topic would you like to focus on first? Yeah. I mean, I think AT&T is probably the big story here where, um, you know, you have basically what showed us how important AT&T's network infrastructure was. And, I think my takeaway is just how much we need redundancy in these systems and services that we rely so heavily on. Yeah, I um, I definitely agree. Like the internet, you know, when the internet was first being designed, it was supposed to be like a totally like open thing. But as time came on and companies became a thing, we keep seeing it get more and more uh, centralized because it's more efficient. It's more cost effective, right? ISPs are that way where they have these big head ends that store all their equipment to serve millions. Um, even like online websites, right? Like think, think about this for a second, right? Before you even access the internet, you have two gatekeepers. You have your internet service provider who is one who could totally control your experience. Like if they really wanted to be nefarious, just block the, you from accessing specific DNSs to say competitor services. And then you have Google, who's like an arbitrary of the internet, right? Like before you do anything, right? The search for a web browser or a web search, it's all done through Google. So if something happens, which it did happen, Google had that, you know, Google had their major outage recently too, which knocked out like all Google services. The internet basically becomes useless and companies aren't able to do stuff because we're so reliant on these company services. Like it's really not a good space. And 
hopefully this will be a, like a learning point of the importance of having redundancy, right? You know, not just relying on that one main fiber trunk, but having already a second route in place, you know, having the extra towers, having the backup batteries for when terrible storms happen so that you have backup plans A, B, and C, because anything that can go wrong will go wrong, basically. Yeah, what is that, Murphy's Law, I think? Yeah, Murphy's Law. <laughs> um, and I will just say, like, even though this happened to AT&T, at least in my personal experience, I found that T-Mobile is the weakest when it comes to having redundancy and redundancies in place. I find that they do not do the proper things that back up batteries in place or back up generators in place. Um, and I find that they're most prone like this year, um, you know, when they were doing the upgrades. Right. We saw that major uh, failure where like all of the Northeast had no T-Mobile service. Do you remember that from earlier this year? That major. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, I do remember that. So, but it's just, it's amazing. I mean, I think to me, it really shows that we need to prioritize emergency services and really make sure that the people who need the service have access to it. It's reliable. It has backup systems in place. So it stays online uh, because really, I mean, with the AT&T situation, when, you know, the 911 services went down, that's pretty huge. And I even was reading that some hospitals were affected and even T-Mobile was affected like 250 miles away just because they were relying on certain AT&T components. So I think um, to me, as you said, Dennis, like this is kind of a wake up call. And I think it shows that all carriers and all networks uh, need to kind of come together to form redundant systems to to really make sure they can deliver the service and uh, the experience that customers need. Because if they don't, I mean, you're potentially missing huge bits of information and uh, it hurts sales. Like if you know, if Amazon Web Services goes down, right, or something like that, uh, you just miss out on so much online commerce and uh, and transactions and things like that, along with um, just need to make sure emergency communication services are, are up and running. With how important it is that these communication services do stay up and running, especially since like dispatch and stuff like that rely like, you know, the first net deal, right? Do you think that the government should possibly step in and basically make all the cell phone networks like utility companies and isps like utility companies instead of we having this like this private market of like this oligarchy right do you think the government should step in and basically be treating it almost like national defense basically this is an excellent question i think for for me personally i feel that the government could be doing a little bit more in this area i mean to me having internet access is a lot like having access to clean water it's just it should it should be a right for everyone. And I think it's so important and fundamental to our society that I want to make sure everyone has internet access at an affordable price point. Um, but I don't know, I'm kind of torn because on the other hand, it may be possible that having competition between the major providers helps spur innovation and challenges them to think in new ways to, you know, to stay ahead and, and to stay competitive and stay leading. Um, but on the other hand, does I it mean, really though? I mean, like, if we think about it for just a quick second, right? Like, yeah, competition's great when it works properly, but at a certain point, the market gets so concentrated that the competition doesn't matter. Like, for the longest time, they're right. AT and T and Verizon, when they were the duopoly and T Mobile and Sprint couldn't touch them, right? We yep. saw plans were super expensive. We didn't see either of them try to do anything like groundbreaking to capture more market share because they already had like the vast majority. So like nothing really happened there, right? And we get the facade of choice with all the NVNOs, and we are seeing some exciting things. Like I will not deny we are seeing some very exciting things, but at the end of the day, like when it comes back to the core most important thing, network performance. We generally see the same trends across the carriers regardless of how we slice it, right? Like urban markets like New York are always the focus for all the carriers. Rural markets are always the ones that suffer and are behind. And like that trend has been going on for it seems like as long as the dawn of time type of deal. And it hasn't changed. Like no carriers went out and said like, you know what? There's a there's an unfulfilled niche in this market. Rural Americans. I'm going to go out and just focus on. No, no carriers ever done that. So. Do you think that it might be worth just being like, you know what? Government comes in, owns all the infrastructure, and then if companies want to, say, lease data like NBNOs do, they can. And then they can do their own thing. But the government's job should be the ones to maintain the infrastructure, something like that. 
Like, I yeah, I could see. Be I'd be open to different approaches. I'm not sure. I feel that the government has been particularly functional in certain capacities. <laughs> so maybe a private entity that could execute what you're describing at a much higher and more effective and efficient level. I'd be totally open to that. Uh, and I'd actually be curious if there are other countries that end up doing this and how that works. South Korea. Um, South Korea boom. doesn't feel like what I'm talking about, where basically there's two carriers. They share the same infrastructure but they still do their own things and then there's like prepaid options but at the end of the day they share infrastructure and in, in like places like europe um like france i was talking to a random youtuber he was telling me he's getting like 2.5 gigabit internet being rolled out for like 30 euro i'm just like oh my gosh wow. and I, it's actually so true i see comments on all my videos that i think in india and many european countries the cellular data rates are just so much cheaper it's unreal well, the reason it's cheaper is because it's funded by taxes. Like it's mandated like stuff like this is what's going down. And the government says, you know, it's fiber, like boom, here it is. And like the upfront cost is expensive, but the government has that ability to pull things together. Like, like believe it or not, like in the US, like I'll, I'll give you my state of Pennsylvania in particular. So Pennsylvania, the tier one ISP here is Verizon. They're the ones that lay like the main fiber trunk that everybody else like Comcast ends up having to hook up to at some point or Armstrong or some other provider, right? And we in Pennsylvania actually took funding from the E911 recovery fee that we charge to pay for Verizon to lay down fiber across all of Pennsylvania and get all Americans connected. And that was like 20 something years ago. And it was supposed to be done by like 2008 and then we extended it to 2012 and it never happened. And there's other states that did very similar things with Verizon and AT&T. Some of them are doing lawsuits. But long story short, we saw a lot of the money get like pocketed basically. Or they would do weird things with like servicing one house and saying the whole zip code was covered. Right. Um, and it, they just kind of like broke the deal and nothing ended up happening. Like I feel like that's a sign. That's a sign we need yeah. something to change. Yeah, like I feel like if the government was doing it, at least people could like actually complain. Like you can vote out your local congressional men and a lot of the problems and expenses would kind of go away, right? Like if the if the federal government is the one that's putting up towers, right? Your local municipality isn't going to have people to like fight you about permitting. It's the federal government versus some private entity, right? Like we're seeing it with millimeter wave being a big issue. You know, people complaining about it popping up. You yeah, you know, you're probably right. We probably have faster, more efficient rollouts of networks. I mean, look uh, at China. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And, I, you know, the other thing is we have basically the spectrum, the frequencies and the infrastructure to cover everyone and provide amazing speeds. But because everything is so segmented and not working together, you know, we come up with this more fragmented experience where in some states you get excellent coverage on one network. And in other states, uh, that network is really poor and another network dominates. Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about inefficiencies. Think about the fact of this. Uh, 700 megahertz, right? Like yep. AT&T might have blocks A and B. T-Mobile might have block C. And then Verizon might have D. Or like there's lots of instances where Spectrum isn't like co like continuous. And so that's why AT&T had to deploy like three-way, four-way, five-way carrier aggregation, right, to combine all these different bands, when it would be so much easier just to deploy a big old 100 by 100 block of, you know, band whatever, right? Like, that's yeah. way easier. And then phone compatibility could also get a lot simpler, too, not only for us as domestic consumers, but also for people that come, like, internationally as well, right? It? It's so true. It's so true. Like, just think about the confusion back in the day when CDMA and GSM were like fighting each other. Do you oh remember? my gosh. Yeah. It's that was a disaster. I don't know how that happened. We were the, I think we were one of the only countries where that was a thing too. I'm pretty sure China, the rest of the world. China, South Korea, and I think maybe Japan were like the, like the three that like had CDMA. Yeah. And everyone else was just like, yep, GSM, that's the way to go. So much easier. I really respect that. But off the topic of redundancy, I want to focus on T-Mobile and their data breach because this is not the first time. Stetson. Yeah, I'm actually, I have two active, three active lines on T-Mobile right now. <laughs> Stetson, first, I want to ask you, um, what do you, do you think T-Mobile is doing everything they can to actually keep us secure? Like, do you think this is just part of the game that happens? Or do you blame T-Mobile for this happening as many times as it has? I think at this point, I'm going to blame T-Mobile and they just... 
I think they're factoring this in as like a business expense, you know, like, all right, this probably happens and we pay this much to fix it. And, you know, we move on. I, I'm, I don't know, or maybe they're just being targeted, but to me, it seems like they could be doing a better job. That's my take. What, what would T-Mobile have to do to basically like earn your trust again or make you feel like they're actually doing something? I would want to see a report of what they're actually doing and why, like the problem they found, the steps they took to isolate the problem and then what they're go doing going forward to make sure it doesn't happen again. I just feel like that uh, sort of transparency uh, and, and openness with the consumer in to, for me at least helps build trust and confidence in uh, the network and the, in the company itself. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I would agree with that sentiment and I was just going to tell you, but I actually have some real changes I'd like to see. Um, yeah. First is that T so I'm sure you've heard about the SIM swap scam where like someone. Yeah, that's them. huge. Yeah. T-Mobile easiest one, the trick. I swear to God, half the time when I call in the uh, representatives, I do not even ask me for my, my special pin that I have set up like at oh. all. Yikes. That's and, pretty big. And um, I remember when I was like activating a new SIM card, when I got like my new phone, they didn't send me like a text. Like a simple like two factor text that I have to read them a code like that would be something really simple that would really help a lot to you know like having multiple layers of that. security you know to prevent that would be great right like I don't want someone just to be able to call in and be like I'm Dennis and then my last name and just be like able to do whatever they want on my account so I think it starts just with like simple training and enforcing just basic procedures that other carriers already do like with AT and T. Anytime I want to do a major change, I have to go to a store and show them my driver's license, like in the store. Yeah, like, that, and that I, sounds and, right. And every time I talk to AT and T, they ask me for the pin before they even talk to me even about a billing question. I, I have to give them a pin. So, like AT and T, for example, has got a lot in place. I like what they do. They might have one or two reps that don't follow the rules perfectly, but at least AT and T is like doing stuff, and you don't typically hear about them getting breached. Uh, Verizon can't speak because I haven't had them personally, but uh, T-Mobile to me, uh, very laxed about the security approach. And I feel like they should be doing better. Two-factor authentication should be mandatory. Uh, the pin should be asked every single time for SIM swap exchanges. I feel like an in-store visit should be required. I know it's highly inconvenient to people to have to visit a store, but I feel like that's like the only like sensible way to do it outside of having like i said some form of like multiple authentication if you did ship it or something but yeah i don't know uh where else to really go with that uh if you want to talk about patreon now i feel <laughs> ready now's a good time to do it yeah yeah i think we can segue into that uh so we had one patron question today so first of all thank you to breaking data for submitting an excellent question that i really appreciate and actually made me smile this morning the question is what is one non-tech item that makes you happy or what's one you can't live without and i took it upon myself to define a non-tech item as something that didn't have a power button uh, because as i was going through i mean there were so many things uh that i enjoy that are just tech related i mean I love technology. I think it's so exciting and it's so fun to use. Um, so what I ended up settling on, I was actually this bonsai plant I have. So it's a rock juniper bonsai that my friend gave me when I moved into my new apartment in Longmont. And it's really nice. It's cute. Uh, and it, it just makes me smile every time I see it. It sits on our uh, dining room table and, you know, water it once a week. And it just it looks epic. I love bonsai plants. So that's that's my one non-tech item. That's kind of like a peaceful zen like item that i really love and enjoy and uh brings a smile to my face every morning dennis do you have a, do you have an item that's non-tech this was actually really hard like i spent a good amount of time thinking about that yeah uh, but do you I, have was, one? I was thinking about it in my car and i was like defining technology in my hand like technically technology could be something like a knife but i'm glad you add that stipulation um but uh i'm gonna do it in two ways i'll say one that makes me happy and one i can't live without um one that I can't live without easily is my glasses. <laughs> um, oh, that's yeah, that's a great one. I was going to say they give me the power of sight. And I thank God every day that I was born in the 21st century and not like the 1900s or something because I would be like blind or it'd be probably expensive to the point of me not affording them. So thank you, God, for glasses. <laughs> and then uh, 
one non-tech item that makes me super happy. You're going to laugh about how simple this sounds, but it's my bed. Um, oh, that's great. I love that answer. Um, I I have this nice queen size bed. It's something I like I I didn't get to sleep in a queen size bed until I was in college and I got my first like apartment to live in because it came with one. Oh man, Dennis, that's and, before me. I'm not even in a queen size right now. Wait a minute. But let me just say, my man, it changed my life and now that I actually got to buy one, it is amazing. I I curl up in it. It's my safe space. Everything is fine. Uh it's warm and toasty and I I the amount of comfort and love that I feel for that mattress, like I could easily if I could somehow find a way to stay in it all day. So I love my bed. I think I'll add a second one to mine and it's Settlers of Catan. That has got to be my favorite board game of all time. And I've gotten countless hours of enjoyment playing Settlers of Catan with my friends. Uh, and so I think that's that's going to be my my number two there behind the bonsai. I feel like mine were so lame in comparison. I'm sorry, breaking data. <laughs> <laughs> No, I thought they were interesting. They're good. I mean, it's sometimes it's just the simple pleasures of life. You got to take time to appreciate and enjoy. Okay, so next question and final question for this show was you have $100 to spend on phone service and subscription services. Everyone's looking to get a subscription service, Netflix, Hulu, things like that. My question is what plan and what subscription services would you get with a budget of $100? I'll let you go first, Stetson. Yeah, so my approach here was to go lean on the cell phone plan and then to just load up on all the services. So I did the math out and you can pick up or I can pick up US Mobile's three and a half gig plan for 20 bucks a month. That's going to include taxes and fees. Uh, then you know what? We have $80 to work with here. So let's just load up on the services. The services we're talking, you can get Google Stadia for 10 bucks a month. You can get Disney Plus for seven bucks a month. I don't actually watch sports. So ESPN and Hulu are kind of worthless to me. Uh, you know, more maybe you're more into gaming. You can throw an Xbox Game Pass for 15 bucks a month. We can get the 4K premium Netflix plan for 18 bucks a month, YouTube premium for 12 bucks. Throw in some Spotify for our music. And I think we've got an entertainment complex that is well built, well rounded, good movies, good TV shows, and good games. Total coming out to about $92 a month. Add in the taxes and fees. And I think you're at that hundred dollar mark. So that was my approach. I would I would go lean on the cell phone plan and then just load up on all of my favorite services. Dennis, what's what's your approach to this uh, scenario we got? So I went one of two ways in my mind. I keep bouncing back and forth, but uh, I'm going to say one that probably won't apply for most people. Uh, I, what I would end up doing is I would get uh, what's called Internet Essentials. It's something that Comcast offers like low income people that you can apply for, um, which I could totally get with the power of using my dad. Um, <laughs> but basically, I would get Internet Essentials so that way I have Internet from Comcast, which is 10 bucks a month. And then with that, I would be able to get their cell phone service, their unlimited everything plan for $45. And the reason why I choose that one is because it's the only prepaid, basically like NBNO style plan on Verizon network that gets like priority data, which is important to me. So I'm at 65 bucks right there. Uh, and then I also have the perks of actually having home Wi-Fi. Oh, and I would have Peacock Premium for free, which people can laugh, but Peacock has some good content. Um, and that's at 65 bucks. And then as far as streaming services that I would buy outside of that, uh, Netflix would be one of them because I want to be able to talk to people. Most people have Netflix. Uh, HBO Max would be my second one because out of all the other streaming services, that's probably one of my favorites. And then I would lastly get the uh, Hulu Disney uh, Plus um, that bundle. ESPN bundle. Yeah, that's a that's a great combo. I mean, I think it's honestly amazing the, the different options you have to choose from here. And it, it just comes down to like what you value and, you know, how much you want to spend or maybe how much you just want to be saving. So, yeah, I think I thought it was fun to, to play around with that. And maybe a fun video would be like to do that at different price points, right? Like if you've got 50 bucks to spend versus a uh, 100 bucks or maybe something even lower or maybe 200 bucks, you know what you could do. Or maybe for families, you know, throwing some math there. Yeah. I mean, I will just say, um, if you wanted me to not pick, like, if you wanted me to pick a broader term, I would just swap out Xfinity Mobile for Visible, basically. In a yeah. Nutshell, oh, yeah. Really I mean, I think I think it's a huge uh, it's a huge value you get when you can get a more affordable plan that works for you. I feel like you just have 
extra capital to work with, to invest in yourself, to invest in more entertainment, maybe to go out to dinner once a week or something like that, you know, just fun little things that, that add up. And I think it, it can help uh, mentally, at least for me, like, all right, uh, maybe I do this. Maybe it's just tricking myself into spending more money, but like, all right, I'm saving money on this. I can just allocate it towards that. And it's like a fun little perk. Well, let me just ask you a quick curveball question. Okay. I know we didn't really plan this out, but if you could only have one streaming service, just one, and it could, it has to be $25 or less, um, what streaming service would you choose to have? I'm going to go with Netflix here and, oh, man, I'd probably go YouTube Premium, but I don't know if that was intended to be part of the question, but I just love that so much I would easily go for it. Um, but otherwise, I would go Netflix. And the only reason I say that is because I've had Netflix for a while and I've enjoyed a lot of their Netflix originals like Stranger Things, and um, they have a lot of the the content I enjoy. So it, I, I don't spend too much time following TV or, or the entertainment industry. So just based on my experience already having Netflix, I'd probably just continue to have it. Like I'm not actually familiar with a lot of the shows on HBO Max, on Hulu. I, I've never even used Hulu, to be honest with you. Uh, I think like once they had something. So uh, it's got to be Netflix for me. That's my that's my go to. Uh, Dennis, what's your preferred? I feel like it's HBO Max. Yeah, I mean, HBO Max is just so good. <laughs> it's just so good. Uh, I was going to say, ironically enough, I've actually been watching a little bit of Netflix. In fact, before we got on this podcast, uh, Netflix has season six of 60 Days In. So I was binge watching that show. Um, it's a tough call. It's a tough call indeed. Um, but I honestly, despite what I always say about Netflix, would probably pick Netflix uh, only because they do have a mix of like tv series that come off of like live cable and you know that i like some of those live tv shows and um and those series and then like you said they do have some good netflix originals i mean there's a lot of bad content but then there's some diamonds in the rough like house of cars was awesome um for a long time there uh stranger things is another good one uh netflix is beginning into anime a little bit with some netflix original animes um and i was watching like something about like the dragonborn prince or something it was made by the people that made like avatar the cartoon and like i binge watched all three seasons of that recently so i'd probably pick netflix as well uh only because um they have a more wider variety of content than hbo max in that sense right yeah 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 absolutely and i feel like a lot of people have netflix and uh, i think you just kind of alluded to this earlier but it's kind of a conversation point talking about a show that's on netflix or, or something like that so it's almost uh just nice having so you can relate to people in terms of going through the same tv shows and journeys with them yeah and the and the only other reason i say that is because i've watched netflix less than hbo i have more things that i can find like I've already watched the Sopranos. I've already watched Game of Thrones. I've watched a lot of stuff that HBO has to offer already. So a lot of that stuff is like nostalgia for me. Netflix has a lot of stuff that's newer that I haven't seen yet. And they've been really diversifying their portfolio. I've been seeing a lot of comedians even make their way onto Netflix, which has been kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I like their strategy. I mean, basically, we're entering a streaming wars where the way to diversify yourself is to make crazy licensing deals and then ultimately to make your own original content. And I think that's been cool to see and fun to enjoy as a consumer. Do you? So here's an analogy I was going to say, uh, and you tell me if I'm off the mark here, but the way I look at things is like this. Netflix is almost like its own entity. And a lot of these streaming services that are coming out are almost like cable television channels because their content is so specifically focused. Like, Peacock is all NBC stuff. So stuff you would have found on like channels 2, 4, and 11. Um, HBO Max, the bulk of their content is HBO stuff and then the Time Warner content that they got. Uh, Disney Plus is all Disney channel, basically, <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, and then you got like CNBC and like, like basically what I'm trying to say is a lot of these streaming channels or streaming services to me just feel like if I had a cable bundle where I was flipping through TV shows and Netflix is the only one that's actually doing like all types of different content. Yeah, yeah. The heavy lifting. You know, I don't know. It's nice. You have the you have the choice. You have the flexibility to choose what you want. And I just wish it were easier where, you know, content wasn't shifting around so much because I know like The Office is leaving Netflix today. 
Um, and I just wish that element was a little bit easier for consumers to follow and understand. But otherwise, I, I appreciate the flexibility and the options. On that topic, by the way, I'm surprised when you were talking about your uh, ideal content bundle, you didn't mention any free streaming services like Pluto or uh, or Peacock or anything. Like, I'm surprised yeah, I don't, I don't even know those existed. I'm not in the streaming landscape. Dennis, I don't even have a TV yet. I ordered one. Wait. It was supposed to be here today. It wasn't. It's coming on Monday. Wait, pa well, first off, we need to touch on that, but but pause. You, you're not aware of Pluto TV? I feel like everybody knows about that. It's no, I've like, never. I've literally, this is my first time hearing about them. Okay, so Pluto's like this like streaming service. It's like live cable, but it's all ad supported, and they got like 900 bazillion channels, and they literally got channels that just 24 seven run the Brady Bunch or something, or like channels that run like anime. And I mean, like it's literally a free just streaming service, like with live channels. Like you don't get you know, your locals or Fox news or something like that. But like they have other alternative news things like cheddar or some other stuff to get your news content, but it's pretty legit. But hold on a second. You still haven't got your TV from B and H that you ordered. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Uh, they, with that? they, uh, it was like, it took them a while to just ship it. And it's a really big item. So I got a 65 inch TV and they shipped it with, um, I forget the the name of the company, but it just took a while for them to actually ship it. And then it shipped right when the holidays were around. And so the five to seven business days has basically extended it where, you know, the Christmas holiday was in the middle and now we have New Year's Day right at the end here. Uh, so yeah, it's coming on Monday. I scheduled the delivery, but I'm super excited either way. Stetson, I thought of another quick question. Okay, um, last one, last one. Then we're going to wrap this up and do a uh, Patreon exclusive live stream. Okay, yeah. Um, my last quick question for you is this. Um, remember we were earlier talking about promos and the free T-Mobile lines? I was yes. just going to ask you if you took advantage of any of the T-Mobile lines, specifically the one that ended today. I don't actually have a T-Mobile account that was eligible for that, so I was unable to take advantage of any of those promotions. Dang, same in my boat. Sorry, um, but... Guys, um, we've pretty much reached the goal of what I set for about an hour and a half for today's podcast. Uh, I think me and Stets are going to call it so that we can do a nice special uh, Patreon only one-on-one uh, -on -one talk with us. Um, I really am glad and thankful for everybody that came out to spend some time with us on New Year's Eve. And I really just want to say that I hope that you and all your family can stay safe and enjoy the holidays despite what everything is going on. And I look forward to talking to you guys come next year. Stetson, you have anything else you want to say to the audience? Dennis, that was a wonderful conclusion. Yeah. Happy New Year, everybody. Here's to 2021. I'm super excited to have you part of this channel, part of the Best Phone Plans podcast. And I can't wait for more exciting content to come in the near future. Thank you to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. If you're interested, you can join there for exclusive perks like a monthly live stream, as well as I have a behind the scenes video I'm actually getting ready to share pretty soon there. Um, so yeah, appreciate everyone's support. Want to wish you a happy new year. And that's going to be it for this episode. Thank you all for listening. I'm Stetson. And I'm Dennis. And we look forward to talking to you in the new year. Take care, everybody. Goodbye, guys.